Welcome everyone. Um, this is the ACA Streams talk in which we try to show uh, both uh, our thoughts behind it and also yeah, the road forward about it really. And we have some demos, uh, some uh, backstory, and we're going to be presenting this talk together with uh, my friend Johan here. So that's Johan. Could you maybe like make it? Can you could you present me like you know I, I can like I'm really smart and then also maybe like so I'm a bit a a really handsome and pretty tall. So Johan's a handsome, pretty tall guy from the ACA team Thank you. <laughs> from Stockholm, and myself, uh, not that handsome, but also ACA team. Uh, Obviously at Lightband, right? So. I'm going to talk about this. Yeah. So um, a lot of things you have seen uh, the last two days probably is, is frameworks. Um, we are doing something a little bit different. Uh, so Aka is a toolkit. It is a box of uh, really nice goodies that you can build your distributed and concurrent applications with but it's not really uh, the whole guardrails thingy where we tell you how you should build your system, right? So it's like tools to do it, but uh, there's like a, a really wide spectrum of um, kind of things you can do with it. Everything from doing small concurrent things in one end of your application to building clustered distributed system stuff. Right, so um, this is a few tools in the toolbox. Obviously, you know about actors, everything we do really is based on top of actors, like abstractions, like clustering, remoting. Uh, you can use actors in the local system just for the concurrency aspect of it, or you can use them in a clustered setting for actually scaling out and handling. Uh, yeah, more than could fit on a single JVM. And then the other things like ACA streams, which we'll talk about today, and persistence, HTTP, all of that is really built on top of actors once we hit asynchronous boundaries. Um, as you know, or maybe don't, Every, every feature in Akka always has a Java and a Scala API. So I'm wondering who's really into Scala in this room? And who's really into Java? Like, there's some people. So in, in this talk and uh, the first version of it, I presented a Java one. So the examples will be uh, actually a few of them in Java. And you'll be maybe surprised. Uh, it's sometimes reasonable. But obviously, we personally at least prefer the Scala APIs for their expressiveness. But you never, you'd never have a penalty for if you want to just start out, teach your team Akka. You don't want to teach your team uh, Scala at the same time. You can totally do that. So people using Akka, obviously a lot of very fun, interesting companies. And let's head to the actual topic of today, right? So the title of the talk today is um, Streams that Reactive streams that just Active work. Streams that just work. Trademark. Um, the word stream you have heard a bunch of times also the last last two days, right? And it's it's a very overloaded word or it's very vague. So if you if you search uh, search the interwebs, then you will see that there is I don't know. There's like a sev seven Apache projects that says that they do something streaming. Yeah, so uh, the question is also, we often get, maybe you yourself were confused during this conference. Yeah, there's Kafka streams, there's Akka streams, there's reactive streams, there's uh, yeah, Spark streaming. Is it the same thing? Well, it's the same word, but it's completely different things. So sadly, in the community, um, these libraries share some concepts. Yeah, there's some event coming in, and we process it, and by the end of the day, we emit some event. But they do it on very, very different layers. And this is something we'd like to explain during this talk as well. Yeah, so let's take a look at what streams is in, uh, in our mind, in, in, uh, from Aka Streams' point of view. So uh, we talk about asynchronous back-pressured stream processing in bound memory, probably also. So a, hey, wait a minute, go back. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so we have a, a possibly infinite stream of events objects, we want to process them in some way, uh, but we don't have infinite memory. Like the stream won't probably be infinite either, but it could be, right? It could be events that keeps coming in every second for, for like day, day after day after day after day. Uh, so um, the concepts in Aka streams is that we have sources, like a source of events. There, that's where the events 
uh, either come from or where they come into ACA streams from another technology or uh, tool. And then we have stages that do processing or kind of uh, some kind of reacting on events, sending them down some path or changing them in some way, maybe throwing them away. And we call those flows. So a flow has, has an incoming stream of things and it has an outgoing stream of things. And then we have sinks, which is kind of the far end. It's something that just consumes, that will just receive events. It will never emit anything in the other end. Um, asynchronous in this sense is that each of these parts uh, may be running on a different thread, on a different thread pool. Um, so we can have asynchronous boundaries in between these stages. We don't have to, but we can have, right? Yeah, um, so let me just jump in. So, um, as you all know, ACA is all about concurrency and parallel programming, right? So this is very much at the core of ACA streams. However, um, we have it in a very declarative way in ACA streams, and we'll talk about how, a de how the declarativeness comes into play here. But basically, once you have your stream, then you can decide how you actually cut it up into the synchronous parts or what you want to fuse. Yeah, so next slide, thank you. Um, so one problem that pops up when you try to do a synchronous streaming is when you have a faster producer than you have a consumer, uh, because it's asynchronous, so you essentially have something like a fire and forget between the stages, right? You don't have a function that you call and it, will, uh, it won't return until it's done. It will be somewhere where you just hand off a thing. And if you keep doing that in a faster rate than the other end can handle, there's like, there's a problem, and you can sort of solve it with buffers, but if, you know, yes. at some point you have to deal with the problem, um, and if you have buffers, then you have basically two options. One is let them, let them grow, and you will fill the memory, in worst case, and you will have a crash, right? Uh, best case, you have thought about this, and you have put a bounded buffer in there, and you will have some kind of strategy to deal with when you hit the far end. Maybe you start dropping, uh, the newest incoming elements, or maybe you start dropping the oldest elements. And this is what various streaming things does already. So if you look at how TCP works, it will have these kind of things in place to solve this problem. Right. So when we started out working on ACA streams, the prime reason we actually wanted to was, for one, uh, more type safety than plain actor APIs. So you can more inspect the layout, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And exactly the back pressure. And wh why did we even think about doing that, right? So we would have customers and projects that, yeah, they do the Greenfield project in ACA, and it's super fast, very easy to write a fast application using asynchronous programming. But by the end of the day, it would integrate with some other legacy things, and we just Wait, these projects would tend and just end up killing these downstreams, right? So we needed some way to integrate with other APIs or libraries or whatnot in a way that we can go as fast as we can, but not faster. We don't want to kill the other application. So back pressure is, is done through the, the downstream, the consumer telling upstream in what, what kind of rate it can actually accept elements. So before, the consumer can produce anything, it needs to get a, uh, a request from, from downstream, which says, I can accept, you can give me 10 elements, and I have a buffer for that, so that's totally safe. So the, cons the producer can then never push more elements than it has gotten a um, ticket to, to kind of produce. Uh, so Andre usually, a friend on, on the team, usually calls them permits, right? So you get permits to emit elements, and you use up the permits as you emit these elements. So uh, this is a kind of like a pull model, but at the same time, all of the messages here, including the permit emitting, is asynchronous. So even though it's a um, batched pull model in that sense, it never has to wait if it's going fast enough and it's getting replenished the permits as fast as, um, faster than it's consuming them. So in the happy case, uh, we never block the source from emitting in the case where we actually do want to slow the source from emitting, well, that's exactly what we wanted. So this was a few, like, the, the simplest use case you can ever imagine. 
or maybe it was a little bit more advanced than the simplest. So we have a, a source of events, we have uh, some processing, and then we have uh, like, like a sync where the elements go out. But uh, so AkaStream isn't limited to, to these very simple constructions, but we can actually build streams or flows that have uh, cycles and branches, and we will still have back pressure all the way through it. So it, it really kind of grows with your use case, with your problem. If you have a really tricksy idea about how to achieve something with streams, then you can probably achieve it with Aka streams, but that doesn't make the simple use case very complicated. Yeah, so it was really, um, we really wanted to make both the simple and the more complex use cases. Like uh, in this example, we have a loop, right? You have a feedback loop. For example, um, a friend of mine uh, was just working on a demo of Aka streams, which has, uh, it's working on audio and it's adding echo to the audio stream. So it's basically doing a feedback loop on the audio stream. And that's very easy to express in Akka streams. You'll see an example. And in other libraries that are very strict on the Fluent APIs, so like in RxJava, it only has the Fluent API. It doesn't have a more graph-focused API. It's very difficult to express loops like that or fan-in or fan-out operations. For us, it's a more native concept. So, this was Akka Streams, but the, at the same time as we were working on Akka Streams, we also founded this um, and led this Reactive Streams initiative to which we invited uh, Red Hat people, Pivotal people, and it was by the end of the day a nice collaboration of many different companies and projects, which was finally actually merged into the JDK 9 as part of the JEP, so that's the Java improvement process. I forgot how you extend JEP. Um, but basically, 266 JEP, which was called uh, More Concurrency Updates, now include, includes what Reactive Streams are. So, what is Reactive Streams? What is Akka Streams? Do people know about both of these? Hands up. Are you confused about Akka Streams versus Akka, Akka Streams versus Reactive Streams? Hands up. Yeah. So that's a pro problem we are having because, again, we have many libraries with the word stream in the name. So uh, what is Reactive Streams? Reactive Streams is a standard, and it's these semantics that we just explained about how we deal, deal with back pressure. We actually encoded that in a set of rules and interfaces, and together with other uh, library authors agreed, yeah, this is the way to do it if we want to do asynchronous stream processing. Why is that important that it's a standard and it's not just ACA? So the key feature of that is really that regardless of which streaming library, like RxJava, maybe Akka Streams, maybe something else, someone implemented a library in, for example, CouchDB uses RxJava to implement their uh, querying, so they just give you an uh, observable. Uh, by the fact of all of these libraries having agreed on this protocol and on these types, you don't need any bridges. You don't care if that library is written in the same technology you're using or not. They all just fit together. No need for adapters, because we all settled on the same protocol. So uh, this is already adapted by a number of people, but with include inclusion in the JDK, it's going to grow and grow adoption even more. Right? So we've explicitly worked on basically not allowing for vendor lock in, in, in any kind of ecosystem. We really want to have these, whatever vendor writes any kind of streaming stuff, so everybody in the ecosystem benefits, including us, of course, and the other libraries benefit as well. So um, if you talk with some people who are maybe fresh to the subject, they will say, yeah, you just implement the reactive streams thing. It's so simple. It's actually like half of the case, because the reactive streams types themselves, basically it's free interfaces. Yes, you can implement them on your own, but the tricky bit is actually all of the concurrency, like details about it, when you can call which methods on it, to still preserve this contract about the back pressure being preserved, right? So these, this, these are the rules about, you don't need to read them, of course, but there's a lot of rules which you need to implement correctly a lot of uh, concurrency, memory, visibility things. So reactive streams is these rules, these interfaces, this interrupt thing, the back pressure semantics, but you don't want to implement it directly. You want to use a library that provided these rules and guarantees that it's going to abide to the spec for you, and then you just use the library and have these guarantees for you. 
So ACA streams is an implementation of reactive streams in that sense. And we implement it to gain from the interoperability with other libraries. Yeah, so to kind of continue on that uh, thread, then um, what we realized pretty early was that that is not the reactive streams APIs is not the abstraction that we want developers who work with ACA to have to deal with, right? So we want to, pr to provide other easier to work with abstractions that would still kind of fit into this uh, back pressured uh, bounded asynchronous stuff. So let's take a uh, 20 very long seconds uh, flash through the, through the APIs. So this is the Java APIs. They're pretty much uh, identical to the Scala APIs. Uh, if you're into Scala, that will look basically the same. Uh, so we have the source that I was talking about before. It has two type parameters. The first is what kind of element does it emit? What is the kind of thing that will come from the source in the stream? Uh, the second one we can just ignore for now. And then we have the flow, and the flow uh, accepts one type of things for the input, and it will have another type for what it outputs. So of course those can be the same thing if, you, if your um, flow doesn't change the type of the things that comes in. Might be it takes away every even number from a, a stream of ints, for example. Then it will be int in and int out, right? Uh, and then we have the sync, which is the end, end of the stream, and it will have one type that is what kind of thing does it accept. Um, so you, I kind of skipped over the, the second parameter. Um, and so this is kind of a little thing to get over when you, when you learn these APIs, and that is that we have separated uh, defining the flow, or like the blueprint of the flow, from actually constructing it. And because we do that, then we also want to be able to uh, emit something when we construct it, when we actually run the flow. So you define the blueprint just like you define a, a method or a function, but it doesn't execute until you call it, right? So kind of in the same way, we want to be able to return something when we actually call it. And this is the second uh, type parameter. So in this case, we... Um, have the sync, which will emit the completion stage. Do you know a completion stage? Do you have a feeling for this, what, what this type is? It's a future, uh, right. It's like futures in Scala. It's a value that isn't, we don't know if it's here yet. It will be at some point, right? So it's an, like an eventual value. Uh, so in this case, uh, the sync is for each. And when we run this stream, when we have pieced the parts together, and when we run it, then it will at some point uh, complete with a string. Oh, that's not right. It's for each. It's, it will complete with something else. But anyways. Done. Sorry. Yeah. So it will complete with, with done when, when the stream reaches an end, if there is an end to the stream, right? Uh, and then we have the like, lower part where we actually uh, combine these parts, and then we run it using something that is called a materializer. But we will get back to that in a while. Yeah. Can maybe so one interesting point to have here is that, I'll jump ahead here, to yeah. show it's really these building blocks, and it's more like Lego bricks that you fit together, and they have to fit together by the number of ports they have, right? A source has exactly one output, a flow has one input, one output, sync has exactly one input, right? So when you fit them together, all the types align, everything works out. But actually, we do support, like we said, more complex things. So. You don't have to have one input or one output. You could have one input, four outputs, and these still would be properly typed. So that's something we really uh, learned during the design of Aka Streams. The initial versions did not have these separate building blocks. It was very much like Rx Java that you just have this very fluent API. But then we thought, wouldn't it be cool if people could just provide a library that gives this flow that takes a maybe text and then emits data about, um, I don't know, was, it, was the person happy in this piece of text or not, like sentiment analysis. So libraries can actually go in and provide you with a flow, with a sync and a source, and this is what we see happening right now. People providing syncs, sources for various, I don't know, for Kafka, for Cassandra, various connectors, right? And it's way easier to combine these things than just if we only had one word for yeah, the stream, right? So, I think you can move along. Uh, this move is along, pretty right. much covered. Yeah. Uh, so that's um, the power user mode is you can have arbitrary 
many ports. And we provide a simple API that's also type safe and guards you from all of the complexities of reactive streams. And you can build your own custom stages very easily. So this was really a focus for us, that we want to be extensible. And it's not like, oh, yeah, Akka Streams doesn't have integration with X, and then you're stuck. Right? It, we wanted it to be that, oh, Akka Streams doesn't have an integration with X, but yeah, it's so simple to integrate that I'm just going to write it, and it's going to be 20 lines, and it just works. So, uh, yeah. You want to talk materialization, or should no, I? No, not really. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, materialization. We keep talking about differences to um, other libraries here. And materialization is really one of them. Um, so, like Johan mentioned, when you write these pieces of code, so here, so uh, I say, uh, so a single, then I map it, and then I finally run it, right? So before we hit this method called run, and any method that has run in the name, we're only dis uh, describing what we call a blueprint. And the blueprint is just a description what we're going to do with this flow. And then we finally, first we can fuse it, optimize it. You can think of it as a planning stage in a um, database query engine, right? They also look at the query, optimize it a little bit, and then they run it. So we're in the same position. We can analyze the stages. And for example, if you have multiple map steps, one after another, we could collapse them together just to avoid the synchronous uh, message passing between those, because Asynchronous message passing helps if you want to spread out the load across threads, but if your operations are as simple as plus one and then divide by two, it doesn't make any sense to do asynchronous message passing between you know, two additions. Right? The asynchronous message passing would dominate the performance of the additions that you're doing. So we have this phase where we fuse and then run the thing. The interesting bit is the parts you want to kind of hint to the materializer that, hey, this should be an asynchronous island, is as simple as just saying dot async, and then we execute that specific part of the graph in its own actor. I so think that's a really important point that you explicitly place these boundaries where it makes sense for your use case, because it isn't sane to do it between every processing step. We have, we have seen that the majority of the Streaming graphs that people build uh, benefit from, from having as few asynchronous boundaries as possible. But of course, there are places where you really want to fan out something over all the cores, for example, and process in parallel. And there, you will know where you want to do that. It's not something that the tool can know for you. Yeah. On the other hand, for stages that we provide and we do know about their semantics, for example, a sync that writes to a file, we know it's going to be blocking because, yeah, it's file access. So we give it a designated dispatcher, for example. That's one of the examples. Or when we know there's an API which will be blocking or a stage that will be super CPU intensive, we can give it a separate dispatcher. And it's the same dispatcher logic and configuration you know from Akka actors, right? So it all fits into that kind of world. Uh, so if you're curious about uh, implementing a materializer, because the interesting bit is, OK, we have AST, kind of a blueprint, and it's completely detached from the actual engine. So um, mostly funded by Intel, but currently an Apache project called GearPump, uh, they basically looked at our DSL, so the stuff you actually write, and figured, well, this is pretty much better than the DSL we have. And GearPump is um, kind of very similar to Flink. If you know about Flink, it's more of a real-time streaming engine that tries to minimize latencies across nodes. It's all implemented on Akka, actually. And then they figured, well, actually, your DSL is very good, but we need to materialize it into our infrastructure. So they just reused it, and there's a talk later in the day um, by Cam, where you can have a look how uh, Akka streams internals look like and how this actually is made possible. So again, we want it to be extensible as the core kind of feature of Akka Streams. Yeah. So just to add something to that, we didn't really mention, but uh, so Akka Streams in itself is a local abstraction, right? You, yeah. you build your stream and you get a stream that will run locally. It's nothing distributed. And what the gear pump people are doing is making a stream that runs somewhere many nodes. Yeah. 
So in, in that sense, then Akastreams is like a, what is it that you used to say? A, a glorified iterator? I, I call it a uh, overpowered iterator. Yeah. Okay. Overpowered asynchronous iterator with various semantics for time and dispatchers and things like that. Yeah. So why is it so important, right? Um, people, when they talk about streaming, they think about oh, Spark streaming and real-time multi-node streaming. They rarely think about uh, the reactive stream. I wouldn't say rarely, but often it's not the first thing you think about when you hear streaming, because Spark streaming has been dominating that world recently. So by the end of the day, if you just have a Kafka here, you have a Cassandra here, where do you put your business logic, right? You have to actually have an application that actually does something with the data, right? It's not enough to ha just have data stores. You actually have to do things with the data. So this is an initiative um, that we playfully call Alpaca, kind of a pun on camel. And the idea here is, like we said, all of what we built is really um, built for extensibility and ease of extensibility. And not even that, whatever you build that is custom, it feels as native as any ACA provided stage, exactly because we have these sync, source, and flow abstractions. So Alpaca is really, from our perspective, something um, in the vein of Camel where the community came together and figured, yeah, we need these connectors because we need to connect these various things together. So this is where we see ACA um, streams kind of shine because the world has moved on from where Camel was enough into a more streaming world but still you need to connect all these things together. So we're really the glue and also the application side of the streaming apps, not the data storage side. Uh, existing connectors. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, and this is not a complete list. Uh, so of course, if you want to kind of, I wouldn't say take on, but if you want to talk about doing stuff that Camel does, then what Camel is is like a huge set of connectors with different other technologies. and sources and, and kind of destinations of data. And um, even though this initiative is pretty recent, like the last couple of months, yeah. we, we already have a, a bunch of connectors to different, different things. Uh, yeah. and and we all have also, like if it was in the previous slide, yeah. we also set off uh, publishing a bunch of articles from the ACA team for people who want to like contribute and add bright connectors for technologies that they have needs for that doesn't already exist yeah. to kind of cover various situations you will be when you want to connect like ex existing APIs that for example are blocking or existing APIs that are asynchronous but in different ways. Yeah. Uh, so as you'll notice, yeah, we say we're kind of like camera. But you'll notice all of these connectors, they really are streaming, right? It's streaming file I.O., it's streaming from HTTP res request responses, it's streaming into S3, it's streaming JSON parsing, it's streaming JSON XML parsing, using actual streaming parsers, and not just claiming that it's parsing. Some libraries do that. And yeah, so we think uh, that's a really interesting uh, time for us. Some demos, finally, right? We've been talking a lot. Let's actually show some code. We'll be doing a um, pretty simple flow, actually. So let's say that was a, actually one of my first jobs was very similar to this. Back then, it took many thousands of lines, and we got it wrong many times. It was about um, you have this service, and actually you're integrating over flat files. Someone's appending to a CSV file or something like that. You need to monitor it, do something with it, enrich it a little bit, and then put it over something else. Usual boring enterprise job, one might say, but it took a lot of effort to actually get it right. So this is only the first step. We're going to show more stuff right after this stage of it. So let's see. And also important question, can you actually see this or should I change colors? Change colors, hands up. Is it OK? Hands up. So probably change colors. I'll try to, maybe the default one. Could you make it italics also? Is that OK? <laughs> OK, I, he I hear and see some thumbs up. So like I said, <laughs> I forgot to change some Java code. Um, so what we want to show is we have an actor system, 
Actor system is basically the place where we hold configuration and all the thread pools live, also the way how you start actors, right? Actor materializer, like we talked, materializer is the thing that takes the blueprint and actually makes it an executable and actually running stream. Obviously, it takes the system because it will be materializing into actors, right? Here, just some configuration for logging. And we will be writing uh, the results of our transformation into Kafka. So this is just producer settings, um, you know, normal plain Kafka configuration, and finally some code. So this is what I meant when I said we want your custom provided stuff to feel as native as you know any built-in abstraction in in Akka. So well, some libraries would say. Um, like a million methods on observable, and if it's not on observable, then it feels a bit different. We tend to provide, okay, this is the file tail source, and you don't care where it's coming from, right? A small difference, but we think the, the feel of everything feeling native, even if it's from the outside of the core library, is very important. So the file tail source, we basically just look at this log file, uh, pull a little bit, we use the JDK uh, notification service here, and then, also important point, so VIA allows you to, so I have a source, right, a source of, um, actually let me show you the type here. So this is a source of byte string, right, source of byte string, and it doesn't really talk about, yeah, this is line per line, right? Instead, what we uh, kind of favor is to provide these building blocks. So we provide the building block, it gives you bytes, then we provide the building block called framing and we provide the different framing implementations. What does framing do? Well, it accumulates the data bytes until it finds the new line. As simple as that. Other important thing to notice here, always when we have any kind of buffering or accumulating, uh, the maximum size, maximum buffer size, is always explicit in Akka streams. That's because we want to exactly know how much memory at max this stream will be using. It's pretty interesting because you look at a description of an ACA stream, you can uh, plus minus calculate how much memory at a max will the stream be taking for one connection, right? Then you multiply by how many concurrent connections you have, and you exactly know at a max how much memory you'll be using for your streaming infrastructure. Because you have this guarantee that will never exceed uh, the max buffer sizes. So we have a framing, so now we have still a source of byte string. However, at this point, so yeah, still source of byte string, but it's chopped up by the new lines, right? So then we convert it to a string and log each of the elements. Where do we write it? So we have the log lines, we map it to a, a producer record. Who of you was uh, on the reactive stream Kafka, uh, Akka stream Kafka talk? Big Shishik? Yeah, so we're using reactive Kafka here. Uh, the story there is that Krzysiek, a year ago or so, started implementing a Kafka integration using Akka streams, and then we decided that um, it's good, but it needs to be a little bit better. So we basically co collaborated, and now it's maintained by both Krzysiek, original author, another community person, Alexei, and the core Akka team. So it's been kind of incorporated into this Alpaca idea. So we just use this to take the lines to a Kafka sync and run it. So I'm going to quickly show you this, and then we're going to go to the more interesting bits, because that's like the hello world, right? So using SBT here, boom, uh, Kafka log streamer, and I have Kafka and, and everything running in the back here. So what's going to happen here is we're watching this file, and here at the bottom, um, I'm just adding some random things into the file, and you see the stream immediately reacts and starts emitting it into the topic. You don't really see anything um, that's um, reading from that topic yet, right? So let's go to the next step. The next step being this. So you need to write into topics like that, and actually the way we treat Kafka is um, like a very big buffer, right? 
For us, this is very much like it's what it is. And it decouples the rates of producing and consuming on various ends of your system. And very often, the consuming side would be clustered consumers. You can maybe explain the concept of competing consumers using. Um, yeah, so we said that uh, the streams are local abstraction. Um, but Kafka, Kafka will allow, allow us to consume the same topic from multiple nodes. And Kafka will make sure that each node gets, uh, doesn't get the same events as the other nodes when they consume it. So this is how we can distribute uh, elements from one topic in yeah, Kafka. Yeah, exactly. So you have multiple partitions. You want to have more uh, nodes chun chunking away from that topic, so each consumes from its own partition. And this is trivially scalable using ACA cluster and cluster sharding, where the sharding key would be basically which partition I want to read from, for example. So let's see how that looks. Will again be pretty simple. So yeah, we have a consumer settings. This is again plain Kafka stuff. And then let me just copy paste this. Okay, copied. And then we have a source from Kafka. And we talked about these materialized values, right? So the source takes will be emitting consumer records, and it also has this materialized value. Why do I want the materialized value? Well, because we're actually sharing consumers. So if you know about Kafka, you can share the consumer. And maybe you don't want to shut down the consumer when the ACA stream has shut down. So we have this additional uh, control value here that you can use to, OK, now please shut down the consumer. So the integration between the streaming world inside of the stream and outside of the stream is really important. You can do a lot of stuff with that. So yeah, Kafka source, pretty trivial. And we use the plain source. Uh, so that would be using auto committing. We also have um, other APIs in which you um, basically get a committable record. And so you can commit it once you're done with it. Or we have a different API that exposes Kafka as a flow. And wherever you pass through an element through that given flow, it does the confirmation for you. So much, much easier than working with the raw Kafka APIs. So, and from there on, it's really just a normal ACA stream. It's a pretty cool thing in here. Uh, okay, I'm just going to skip down a few of the of the stages, and there's this uh, grouped within that kind of shows uh, one one of the kind of things that is hard to do with I don't know with, with other technologies, I would say. So yeah. grouped within is a stage that will collect up to n elements in a in a collection and pass those downstream or it will emit the collection when a time limit, limit ha happens, right? So the, the size limit is sort of this upper buffer kind of protection thingy. But yeah. here we have like, but collect stuff that into collections every, is a second? Every, every second. second we collect all the elements that came in, put them into a collection and pass that downstream, right? So we kind of group over time. Yeah. So let's see that in action, because this is a starts to become interesting once you look at timing in such streams. So let me just, oh, wrong place. I want to be, oh, my hands are frozen. <laughs> it's actually a very weird thing in Texas. Good, we run the thing. And I also want to run the, so I'll just while forever fortune into that head. So we'll keep emitting things into the topic. You'll see that on the left and on the right, you'll see uh, the reading side of it, okay? So now the interesting bit, what we talked about the group, grouped within. Um, the operator works like that, okay? So it tries to accumulate at most 100 elements and then it emits. And then my print line basically just says how many elements it did at, at once, right? Uh, however, what if we stop this process and start it again, and stop it again, and start it, and stop it, and start it. And now I'm going to make it a bit bigger so you can see what I mean. So the data processing keeps continuing if you have data uh, with you know, this at a maximum, we're going to wait a second before we emit more data. 
So at, at one side, you're never un gonna emit more than you uh, limited it, but on the other side, you're never gonna wait longer than a second for getting the data. So this is an operator that works um, just on time, uh, but we have other oper operators that have the same semantics like this one, but they act on back pressure. So for example, I know, okay, the database is not keeping up with writing, so we can act on it and maybe start dropping elements or start conflating elements into a summary element, things like that. Uh, so this is really a unique feature. I recommend looking at it in depth. We have good docs about it. And now the final demo. We have perfect time, I think, 10 minutes, which is Aka Streams on HTTP. Because the prime use case for when we were implementing Aka Streams was really the HTTP server we have. So. Pop quiz time, if anyone's not asleep yet. HTTP is a mm -hmm, protocol. You can do shout outs and maybe get something afterwards from me. Oh, me, oh, me, oh, me. Yeah, it's a networking protocol, yeah. But what else? It's a streaming protocol. OK, someone said it. So why is it a streaming protocol if anyone thinks that's surprising? Well, if, if you get a TCP connection, you don't get like message message, message. You only get this stream of bytes and you need to chunk up the actual data out of it, right? You need to do some parsing, etc., etc. So it really is a streaming protocol. And it also has flow control built in, right? In TCP, that's expressed by the window mechanism. So it says which data it has received and not. So our, TC our HTTP server and our TCP infrastructure is actually as simple as a flow from HTTP request to HTTP response. Uh, this may not look that uh, surprising. For example, you've seen Finagle. In Finagle, they model a HTTP server as a function from HTTP request to HTTP response. But actually, this is a bit more powerful when you think about it, because it's not restricted to, OK, one HTTP request comes in, one HTTP request comes out. Actually, when you think about uh, HTTP2, it's exactly the same, but for one request, you can start emitting multiple responses, right? Because in HTTP2, this is how you model the server push. So by expressing this as a flow and not as a function, you already have some future proofing for the uh, HTTP2 features we're working on. But that's not the end of it. The HTTP entity is really a source of byte strings, right? And this means that if I don't consume the, or maybe I'm slow at consuming uh, the byte string entity here, then this is going to kick back and start back pressuring the TCP connection. What happens if we back pressure the TCP connection where we actually back pressure the client sending in the data? Right? What happens then? Well, the client can't push data, so we won't be overwhelmed. And this just happens well, pretty much automatically. You don't need to care about it. And yeah, WebSockets work the same way. It's exactly message to message. So it's buffers all the way down. And let's see that in action. So let's imagine we're a um, Twitter API. And we stream out tweets to some person's uh, mobile phone. And that person suddenly goes into a tunnel. right? So we would want to, you know, why would I keep generating the tweets, marshalling the tweets, if the person isn't receiving them anyway, because you know, they're in this tunnel, they don't have any reception. So imagine you have a source of tweets, you do some marshalling on it, then you actually write it to the TCP infrastructure, and then the operating system has the um, send buffer and receive buffer, in this case, the send buffer. And once the send buffer is full, back pressure kicks in and will stop generating and marshalling the tweets. So, which leads to bounded memory processing, right? We will never keep buffering the tweets until we blow up. So, let me show you a demo of this one. This is mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, streaming tweets. So, yeah, uh, source, repeat, tweet, hello world. We just do a mock source here. Um, this is the um, Java API for uh, what used to be Spray, nowadays is like HTTP. Looks very similar to what you know and love from Spray. In Scala, it would be exactly that, right? Not much difference. So we're pretty proud of making it not as painful even for Java people. Scala people have all the 
mm, syntax and directives that you're used to from Spray, right? We just improved a little bit around that, but we're pretty much the same. So what is the server? The server is actually taking this guy, which is this flow from HTTP request to response, and we basically just return the tweets, right? We complete with source tweets, and it just will render the tweets line by line as JSON objects, because this is the entity streaming support that decides if we render it line by line or as a JSON array or however any other way you want to. And this is just Jackson marshalling. In uh, Scala, this would be all provided by type classes. Okay, so uh, we can kill this guy. We can uh, close this guy even. We'll start it again. And now I need two tabs at the bottom because cat. Okay, first I'll start the server. Streaming tweets, five. Yeah, demo net stuff. Okay, quick sanity check. Uh, who is not familiar with netstat? Okay, so people know netstat. You can look at the TCP buffer states of your operating system and all those things like that. So what I'll be doing is I'll um, show the netstat of the TCP connected to port 8080. So this is where my server is running. And I'll basically just hit this um, HTTP server that I just wrote by just emitting this ACA stream. Localhost, 8080, and what's the path? Anyone remembers? Tweets. Tweets. Okay, yeah, and it's streaming stuff. And now let's fire up the, it's slightly killing my machine, which is fine. So, and here we see two connections, right? We see the sending side and the receiving side, and this is the buffer state. And now, if I put it to sleep, you'll see the buffers end up filling up. So the receive buffer is filling up on the server. The send buffer is filling up. No, sorry. The send buffer is filling up on the server. The receive buffer is filling up on the client. And it just stops. And the server stops doing anything because it knows, OK, I'm back pressured. No reason to do anything, right? You see that spike there? The spike there was while it was generating the tweets. Once we resume the process, so foreground percent one, buffers get drained, process resumes, we resume generating tweets. And now we're crunching numbers again. Yep. So by looking at the code, really the only thing you did is complete with this ACA stream and all the back pressure semantics. You don't care about them, you get them for free. Uh, this works with anything that exposes a reactive streams interface. Could be databases, could be um, like messaging systems, like uh, Kafka, and, uh, any RabbitMQ thing, anything that exposes the semantics, and just works without you caring about this part. Okay. So, um, yeah, that was the Java part, and I wouldn't be myself if I wouldn't be showing Scala on a conference. So this is the exact same part in uh, Scala. So you see the path directive, very similar. You just say path tweets, you complete with the source that's repeating the tweet, and the actual marshalling is provided by the fact that we have this entity streaming support, it's an implicit, and the JSON format, so we know how to actually render the tweet. If we wouldn't provide one or the other, we got a compile error that, hey, you forgot to tell me how to actually render a tweet into JSON. So this is really the full code for, well, it's missing some inputs, I'm sorry. But it's the full code of the class uh, that you would need to write a very simple service, right? very simple microservice. So we think it's a very good fit for very small microservices. If you want something more guided, that's the lagon part of it. We can talk about that later if you want to. So next steps. Yeah, what, what is up next for? For the ACA team, right. Um, so, and also what what was up pretty recently, I would say. Yeah, so, the remoting. Uh, like the latest thing we have spent time on is we rewrote um, 
the remoting layer for for ACA, the transport using Aaron and UDP uh, instead of TCP, which was the old uh, remoting protocol. Yeah. So again, it's also implemented using ACA streams. Uh, so we do see a lot of lot of use cases for just for local abstraction, even though what well, it's remoting is for you know distributed part of ACA, but there's always some local part to it. Yeah, and definitely a, a bit of dog fooding sort of. Um, so coming up is more more uh, integrations for Alpaca for more more things to connect it with. Uh, also work on reactive Kafka, and we on purpose decided that I would read this slide because. So Conrad is Polish, right? And for great comical effect, when I was going to pronounce the Polish guy's name. Krzysiek. Krzysiek 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, we're also making progress with Akatyped, which is um, typed actors, where you define the protocol in a, in a typed way, which is very interesting, at least yeah. to me. So as many of you probably have been hoping, Aka typed is progressing again, and this time we think it's this could be it. If you mean, you know, you know, the big it that actually solves the problem. We've been attempting to solve typing actors for a number of years, and Roland, which um, well, he has left the team, but he's still very actively working with us, and we're helping out to proceed on the typed front. And yeah, in the last year there was some good research papers published which really helped us out to progress on that front. So it's it's far from um, like stable or something that you would actually build something on yet, but it's absolutely worth to play around with if you're interested. It yeah, we think very it's, promising. It's, it's like on the forefront, like the super bleeding edge of distributed systems. There's no typed distributed system thing is like that, really. Yeah. OK. Uh, um. So and then also lately, uh, Conrad and Johannes on the ACA team has been uh, looking at a proof of concept on ACA HTTP2. So it will essentially be the exact same APIs, but you will uh, bind them to a HTTP2 server, sort of. There will probably be a sp small differences, but in, in general, the, the idea is to kind of have the same abstractions. Yeah. And last thing that we're really excited ab about, uh, so Nitesh Kant is here, maybe in the audience, maybe uh, not here, but on the conference at least. It's a collaboration with both Facebook and Netflix about um, put, taking the reactive stream semantics and putting them on the wire. We actually do want to avoid um, TCP there because we think, um, well, we do flow control on the application layer anyway, so we can do a bit better than just slapping a TCP on, on it. So is this stuff ready to adopt? Is it uh, both future-proof and ready already? <laughs> totally. So please go ahead, adopt, and give us a shout out if what you like, what you don't like. All of the modules are stable, except HTTP, the DSL. And that's going to change basically next week or next next week, once I'm home and we can stabilize the last two bits. And then we release it as a stable module, all of it. So a uh, few links. Uh, this is where you can find us. Uh, the mailing list, the chat rooms, and the stream contrib library if you want to contribute stuff. Um, yeah, Company plug, this is what we're about, and this is how ACA fits into this landscape. So we're really the core of many technologies that, that we provide. I wrote a mini book. Uh, it's not out yet, but if you're uh, kind of confused what the hell is reactive, uh, or maybe you have like friends or um, managers that are very confused about what the hell is reactive. Uh, that's a mini book that might help there. Otherwise, that's all we got today. So if you have any questions, we probably have time for one or two. Yes, I hear we have time for one or two. Here in the front. Okay, let me repeat the question. The question was, uh, yeah, we create this uh, actor materializer, and what actually happens if I reuse the same materializer to run the stream, or if I create two materializers and run streams using the different materializers? Uh, currently, uh, wouldn't change much. Uh, the materializer is a pre pretty lightweight object. It would only change uh, 
naming slightly. Some internal names that you would see in logging basically have a counter, so it says, oh yeah, I'm the first stream, I'm the second stream, if you don't name them explicitly, so that would change. Uh, but not much else right now. However, I would recommend to treat the materializer the same way as you treat the actor system, as in, you probably want to have one, because we may put in some caching or some, you know, optimizations there that if you keep materializing the same stream, maybe we'll prefuse it and things like that. So prefer to, treating, to treat it as, yeah, I have the one and I reuse it, reuse it. One last question, maybe. Sorry? Yeah, well, the supervisor. Yeah, I hear a question in the front. Yes. Oh yeah, picture, of course. Uh, so the first links are actually the most uh, useful if you want to get hacking. So we have these tags called community, low priority, easy to contribute on the ACA repositories. If you want to help out, that's great tickets to get started. And if you have any other questions, can just grab me or any of the other ACA team members. We're here for the rest of the day. So thank you very much. Hope this was helpful and see you around.